Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And God said, take your son, your only son, him you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy, he said. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sun on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Uz the firstborn, Buz his brother Kemuel, the father of Aram. Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah brought these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Rumah, also had sons, Teba, Geham, uh, Tahash, and Mecca. This is the word of the Lord. What is God doing? Do you ever feel that? What is God doing? Some of us today, I expect, are not yet seeking to live by faith in the Lord Jesus. Maybe we're just exploring, investigating a bit. And maybe, actually, if you're honest, the whole idea of living by faith seems a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> I can't imagine doing that. Most of us here, I expect we are seeking to live by faith, trusting in what God says and trying to live it out. But sometimes we find ourselves asking, don't we, what is God doing? This seems impossible. This call to live by faith, it just seems impossible. I mean, we know what God says, don't we? He says to live free from the pursuit of wealth. But living simply and generously just seems impossible sometimes. 
We know that he says that sex is for loving marriage between a man and a woman. Sometimes that just seems impossible to do. We know that he says in the Bible that self-control is possible in any area. (laughs) That just seems impossible sometimes. What is God doing when he calls us to live by faith? I know that feeling well. I imagine you might too. And Abraham certainly knew it well, didn't he? We'll see today in the story that that experience of wondering, what is God doing? That actually opens a door. It opens a door to seeing Jesus more clearly. And so let's pray together that God would do that for us this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is good and true. Please would you show us Jesus now. Amen. Well, please do keep Genesis 22 open in front of you as we look at that together. And as Judith read it, it raised lots of questions, didn't it? I gather you've looked at it in small groups as well this week, and I imagine the questions are flying and flowing. What is God doing here? You've been following the story of Abraham's life, haven't you? All the ups and downs, the roller coaster. But now this challenge seems utterly impossible, doesn't it? Is that because of the microphone? No. Um, Fine. Well, let's look at it, okay? The first thing in the story is the extreme test, isn't it? Look at verse 1 with me. God tested Abraham and summoned him. Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now, verse 2 is one of the most perplexing verses in the whole Bible. Just look at this. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Now, thankfully, we've been reassured by the narrator that this is a test. Okay, Isaac's not actually in danger. It's definitely not God's character to require child sacrifice, unlike many of the gods at that time that people worshipped. But still, Abraham, he doesn't have a lot to go on. He doesn't have a whole Bible yet. He's had a few experiences of God's, but he didn't know much. So would he obey? Well, his response says it all, doesn't it? Here I am. He actually says that three times in this story. In fact, they're his only words to God in this story. In the past, if you know the story, his faith was less mature, and sometimes he would seem to doubt what God says or suggest alternative plans to God. But now he's grown. His faith has matured. And now he says, your wish is my command. Now it's helpful to know God's testing is very different from Satan's tempting. Okay? Satan tempts us to sin, doesn't he? Which always harms and destroys and brings death. God's testing is actually to test our obedience and faith and to strengthen us in it. But still, this test is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, the whole of the last 10 chapters has been about God's promises through Isaac. And God has been really explicit. He said, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be counted. Not Ishmael, the half-brother, but Isaac. And now, he says, verse 2, take him, your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him. What? It's a direct contradiction, isn't it, of what God has been promising. It seems completely absurd. And that's the point. That's what makes this the most extraordinary test. There was no way Abraham could see how God was going to figure this out. I mean, remember back in chapter 12, this is actually a bit of a parallel to where the story began. Do you remember back when it started and God said to Abraham, go to the land, I will show you. And now he says again, go to the mountain, I will show you. Before he had to give up his entire past, his family, his household, his homeland. And now he has to give up his entire future. It's such an extreme test. 
but it is met with extreme obedience. Extreme obedience. Verse 3, Abraham obeys. First thing in the morning. And we see here that faith means two things. It means receiving God's promises and saying, yes, please. But it also means receiving God's commands and saying, yes, sir. Faith does both. But just imagine, we try to imagine what was going on in Abraham's heart and mind as he packed their bags, loaded up the donkeys. We read verse 3 how he cut the wood piece after piece. Well, when they're all ready, end of verse 3, it says, He set out for the place God had told him about. And they reached the spot, verse 4. And now notice a really key word here in verse 4. It says, he saw. He saw the place in a distance. That idea of seeing is going to be really important. Well, they've been hiking for three days. And in verse 5, we get a clue as to how Abraham is doing what he's doing. Did you notice this as Judith read? It says in verse 5, He said to a servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Hmm. Somehow, as Abraham walks in radical obedience, he also believes that God will keep his promise. God can't let the boy die. <laughs> he can't. That promise will stand for certain And God has to be obeyed. (laughs) Do you see? He's holding both together. He can't work out how it's all going to work. But he knows that the promise will stand and he must obey. Hebrews 11 in the New Testament actually really helps us to understand because it tells us that Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So he knows that even death cannot prevent God's promises from standing. And so the painfully slow narrative inches its way forward as the tension increases. Verse 6, he took the wood, he placed it on Isaac. Must have been a decent-sized teenager by now. And then there's this very poignant moment. And notice how the words father and son keep appearing. End of verse 6, it says the two of them went on together. And seven, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You can imagine Abraham. Fair question. All Isaac knows is they're going to offer a sacrifice. All Abraham knows is what God has told him doesn't know how it's all going to work out. Only God knows it all. What will Abraham say? And here we reach the center point of this whole story. Verse 8. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Wow. That is faith. Now, if you examine this text super slowly, do you ever do this in Bible study? You just really slow down and try to look at all the details and see how it's actually written. You see in a lot of these stories in Genesis just how amazingly carefully crafted they are. They're really amazing pieces of art, these narratives. Now, look at this. I tried to put it on the screen. This story is actually made up of three conversations. Okay, The first and the last are God and Abraham. In the middle, he says that crucial line, here I am, his faithful obedience. And then in the middle, you get another conversation between Abraham and Isaac. And again, it's translated a bit differently, but he says, here I am. You see this symmetrical pattern. But then in the middle, at the end of that conversation, you get the crucial central line. The Lord will provide, verse 8. That is what this story is all about. 
But we still don't know how, do we? The tension is increasing more and more. You know that feeling if you go to watch a thriller in the cinema or something? It makes me think of when I watched Argo some years back. You know, it's so incredibly tense, and you're getting to the end thinking, how's this going to work out? And you're about to rip off the armchair seats. It's so tense, it's getting to boiling point. Well, verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand. It's like slow motion, isn't it? He reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. It's been perfect obedience, hasn't it? All the way from Abraham and Isaac. And so now we see God's provision. God's provision. A loose translation of verse 11 would be, stop! Stop right there! This angel appears, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't lay a hand on him. Now I know that you fear God. You've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now, of course, God knows everything. That's never a question. But the fact here is that Abraham's faith and obedience have been manifestly displayed on the stage of history. And in that moment, Abraham saw. He saw something, didn't he? Verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, let me show you just another little bit of geeky detail. Okay, I think it's encouraging and helpful. Um, The word provide, it's actually related to the word to see. You can actually see that in English, can't you? Provide, that video sort of word towards the end there. It's all the same idea. The Lord will provide is the Lord will see to it. So all the seeing that Abraham has been doing throughout the story, it's really building up to this. What he's seeing through this whole event is that the Lord will, We'll see to it. It's kind of a play on words. That's what it's all about. The Lord will see to it. He trusted to the Lord that the Lord would see to it. So everything in the story, the structure, the narrative, the the characters, even the words themselves are all communicating this one key point for us. The Lord will provide. Well, what did God provide? A substitute. A sacrifice instead of the boy. And where did he provide it? On the mountain of the Lord. And with those words, we see what it's all about. This is the lesson that God wants his people to learn throughout time. I mean, just think of the whole Old Testament. If you've ever tried to read much of the Old Testament story, you'll have seen this theme appearing again and again. Sometimes God actually tells his prophets to act out what he's doing, like Ezekiel or Hosea. And this story acts out what God keeps doing. He keeps providing the lamb, the sacrifice for his people on the mountain of the Lord. Now remember mountains, if you've read Genesis, the the mountain back in Eden and with Abraham. It's mountains and trees. They're, They're a picture of God's dwelling place his special place of fellowship with his people. And so when they enter the land promised to Abraham, they built their temple, where? On Mount Moriah, on this very mountain. That is where burnt offerings would be sacrificed day after day, year after year, instead of the people. It wasn't their idea to come up with that sacrificial system. God was providing it for them. It was his idea. The Lord will provide. And this is a fundamental pattern of how God relates to his people, how he can dwell with his people. So think about Isaac. I mean, he looked like he was going to die, didn't he? And yet God spoke a word of life and rescue so that he might live. Just like the Israelites in slavery in Egypt. It looked like they were going to die in death and slavery. And yet, God spoke a word of life and rescue so that they might live through the Passover lambs. And then again in the land, as the people keep sinning and turning away from God, 
he speaks a word of life and rescue, giving them the lambs of atonement so that they might live. Until one day he came himself to offer his life as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, See, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Romans 8, God did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all. Isaiah 53, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Just as Isaac carried his wood up the hill for the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus carried his wooden cross up the hill to give his life for us. The end. I mean, that would be a great ending, wouldn't it, to the story, but it's not actually where the story ends. It's a bit surprising. There's a bit more, because do you know what God loves to do? He loves to reassure us. And so he appears again and repeats his promises to reassure us. He promises, again, maybe he gave Abraham and Isaac a moment to hug it out. I think that was probably needed, wasn't it? Um, but then verse 15, his angel appears again, which is quite unusual. And look at verse 16 with me. He said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. Wow. Now that is the only time in Genesis God says that. Wasn't his word enough beforehand? Yeah. Yeah. But he's repeating himself. He repeats his promise. He wants to stress just how sure it is. So he swears by himself. No one greater to swear by. Verse 17, I will surely bless you. Surely. I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sand. And this time, here's an important point. The promises are not only attached to God's grace... But did you notice they're also attached to Abraham's obedience? So he says in verse 16, because you have done this. And then again, verse 18, because you have obeyed me. And this is where we need to remember that not only is Isaac a kind of little picture of Christ who would come later, but so is Abraham. He's also a picture of Christ. Because you see, Abraham, he's what's sometimes called the kind of covenant head It's his obedience that determines the blessing for God's people. And in the same way, Jesus' obedience determines the blessing for us, his people. We live in that covenant relationship with God. So we sometimes talk about having a personal relationship with God. And yeah, we do. But it's, it's not any old relationship, is it? It's a covenant relationship. So first, back in the garden, there was that covenant with Adam. His obedience or disobedience affected everyone else. Likewise, Abraham, his obedience here affects all those who come after him. And likewise, Jesus, his obedience affects all who come after him. Abraham's obedience meant blessing for the world, as many as the sand on the beach, the stars in the sky. Likewise, Jesus' obedience brings blessing to the ends of the earth, even here in Wallington, even in Balham, even in Hackbridge. Now, there's a lot going on in this story, isn't there? So much more than we can unpack now. But let me try to bring it together with three sort of closing words for us. Um, 2 Timothy 4 says that preaching and the Bible is meant to do these things. It's meant to correct, rebuke, and encourage. Doesn't this correct how we often think of the life of faith? It's not going to be easy. God calls for radical obedience. And so that's why Jesus said, you will have trouble. (laughs) This ain't going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be a trek through the desert. Living by faith in every area of life is not easy. With our finances, it feels risky and costly. With our sexuality, it'll mean being countercultural and maybe mocked. With evangelism, speaking up about Jesus means crossing a pain barrier sometimes and putting yourself out there. Living by faith in church planting is turning out to be a little bit scary and risky. But God never said it would be easy. 
It's a radical call. You will have trouble, but Jesus said, take heart. He's overcome the world. And so this path is hard, but it is good. It's the surprising path to joy and blessing. And so for some of us, there might be a bit of a rebuke here as well. I don't know most of us in the room, but James, when he retells this story in the New Testament, not your James, James in the New Testament, um, he says, doesn't he, that this story teaches us that faith without deeds is dead. So we have to ask ourselves, are there deeds in our lives which show that our faith is alive? Deeds of love, deeds of humility, deeds of repentance. If there aren't, that should be a serious warning to us. Uh, We can't just dabble. God is God. And he calls for faith and obedience. It will never be perfect obedience. But we can expect progress in obedience. Faith without deeds is dead. But lastly, if you're here today and you're receptive to God's word, you want to hear what he's saying, be encouraged. Be encouraged by this story. Um, Because we don't have the faith or obedience of Abraham, do we, if we're honest? Uh, We should, but we don't. And that is why Jesus came. And so, whenever we feel, what is God doing? I can't understand. Living by faith seems so impossible. Remember the heart of this story. What's it all about? The Lord will provide. And we can say even better, can't we? The Lord did provide. He did provide the Lamb. The Lamb of God whose death deals with our sin once and for all. Jesus is everything. He's the ultimate Abraham, isn't he? The ultimate man of faith, uh, whose obedience can be credited to us. He's also the ultimate lamb, uh, the perfect substitutionary sacrifice, whose death pays for all our sins. And he's the ultimate Isaac, the son of the father, who really died and rose again. Praise God. He did provide on the mountain of the Lord so that we might really live. Shall we pray together? Lord God, thank you so much for speaking to us in the scriptures The story is so perplexing and puzzling in many ways, and yet the central thing is really very clear. Thank you for reassuring us again and again that you provide the lamb for sins. Thank you for the substitute. Thank you that you did not withhold your own son, but gave him up for us all. And so, Lord, help us to walk in faith and obedience. Pray for each one of us for whatever areas your spirit might have been convicting us of or prompting us to think about or talk about or repent of. Please, would your word not be snatched away from us now, but would it sink deep into our hearts and bear fruit? For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.